Terrific. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for remaining with us uh, at this Wroclaw Global Forum. My name is Damon Wilson. I'm Executive Vice President uh, at the Atlanta Council. And this session is about Ukraine, reform in a time of war. I want to encourage all of you and those that are following us online to participate in the conversation with our hashtag WGF15. Um, it's pretty clear to everyone who's been here from the beginning that Ukraine has been present in this conference since the very beginning. Uh, whether it was President Komorovsky's opening address, uh, our discussions that we had on Russia or energy on this stage, the inspiring Freedom Awards uh, last night uh, with Nadia Savchenko and Donetsk National University, or even the discussion on war of ideas earlier this morning, Ukraine has permeated every conversation that we've had over the past couple of days. Um, now we have the benefit of hearing the view from many Ukrainians themselves, along with the, some that are recently Ukrainian, that are uh, of Ukrainian heritage, and that represent uh, some of us in Ukraine as well. This session is about reform in a time of war, uh, but I came here directly from Washington, uh, delayed my departure for one day, where we hosted Prime Minister Yatsenyuk in Washington for a breakfast, where he used a line that I've heard from him before and others being very clear um, that Ukraine is actually fighting a two-front war. Um, that first, it's Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its sophisticated efforts to destabilize the country. Uh, but second, it's also a war against the Soviet legacy, 25 years of misrule and corruption. And so I think we want to get into that in this conversation. But for the Atlanta Council, this isn't just an interesting conversation that we're about to have. Uh, we view this in part as part of a strategy session for our own work that we're taking forward. You have probably noticed that we have been, uh, if you will, on offense on Ukraine, uh, really pushing forward on what we've called a Ukraine and Europe initiative that we uh, launched uh, in the beginning of 2014 uh, when we saw in the run-up to Crimea how serious the situation was going to be, not just for Ukraine, but for the transatlantic community with the goal of how to galvanize the transatlantic community to better support Ukraine and deter Mr. Putin. And yet, in our assessment, our response is not yet commensurate with the challenge that we face. And I think that's part of what we want to get in today. Um, we've got just a terrific lineup. Minister Ivaris Abramovicius, who is next to me, the Minister of Economy, Economic Development, and Trade in Ukraine. Ambassador Jeff Pilot, Pyatt, the U.S. Ambassador uh, to Ukraine, who's had an outspoken, uh, outspoken voice uh, on these sets of issues. Oksana Siroid, who is with us as the Deputy Chair of the RADA, uh, from the Self-Reliance uh, uh, Party, which she leads in the, in the parliament, um, followed by the mayor of Lviv, who is with us as well, Andriy Sadovy, uh, who is the leader of the Self-Reliance uh, list, the leader of the party uh, uh, that is pushing much of, a, much of a reform agenda, followed by Eugene Choli, who is president of the Ukrainian World Congress and one of our key partners uh, in the Ukraine and Europe initiative of the Atlantic Council, and Pavlo Sharaveta, who is now a senior fellow at the Center for European Policy and Reform, uh, but also a former Minister of Economy and a veteran of the Rotslav Global Forum. Um, so I want to turn to Oksana, if I might, to you. You are uh, charged in a position now of helping to really lead this agenda from the Maidan to translate that into action uh, through the RADA. Uh, and I think much of what we've talked about is there is some skepticism in some European capitals, as well as, well as in Washington, of whether we're going to see fundamental change in Ukraine. In other words, is it actually worth the West uh, to bet not only its prestige, but its resources on a Ukraine that has such a difficult pa previous record? Why is it any different this time? Please, Oksana. It is different, uh, and uh, I would like to maybe to draw your attention and to look at the, to this problem from a little bit broader perspective. You have to... Um, I think this is the time for us to face the reality where we are, and uh, I'm very happy that from uh, that in this auditorium and from this stage, there were so many right ideas and messages already outspoken. But I would like to uh, maybe to stress on the some of them, and that is very important for us from the point of view to find the proper solution and proper answer to your question, actually. First of all, um, we finally have to, to operate proper notions on what is going on in Ukraine. Because we are traveling a lot. And in some European countries, even though they are very good uh, in, their, um, you know, in their attitudes toward Ukraine, but they still operate the notions that prevent them from proper solution of the situation. Like 
Ukrainian crisis, conflict in Ukraine, and so on. If we operate such notions, we will never find proper solution. Because if we presume that there is Ukrainian crisis, it means that Ukraine can resolve this crisis. And this crisis is not Ukrainian. So I would suggest that, and, and I hope that this auditorium of Budi would be unanimous in um, sharing that uh, there is no conflict and there is no crisis. There is a war. And this is the war that Russia holds against Ukraine, Ukrainian people, and actually all civilized world. Europe and US, whoever would uh, adhere and subscribe to those values and principles of democracy. Second, and it was already mentioned and very nice um, stressed that Ukraine is determined to succeed. And this is partially answer to your question, that to actually to resolve the situation, Ukraine has to be successful. But what it means to be successful in, I will give you an example. Today also it was very nice noted that uh, there, whether or where there is no military solution to this conflict. I agree that there is no military solution for this conflict. But if we say that there is no military solution, it means that Ukraine should be military strong. This is the paradox. The stronger Ukraine is in a military sense, the less military solution would be to this conflict. And the third thing, but it also is very important, and especially from, from the European perspective and from transatlantic perspective, that uh, actually Minsk, Minsk is important because Minsk give us, the real Minsk give us um, the chance to think over, but Minsk cannot overrule international agreements and international legal order that has been so far undermined by Russian policy and Russian aggression. I'm speaking in, in particular about UN Charter, Helsinki Final Act, even Budapest Memorandum. I'm sorry, we cannot substitute by Minsk all those important things. And I think this is the time for us to face the reality and to think globally how not to only solve it in short-term perspective, but be proactive and look for the medium-term and long-term perspective of resolving this big problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oksana. Let me turn to uh, Mr. Mayor. Let me turn to you, uh, Mayor Sadovi. Uh, Mayor Sadovi is going to speak in Polish, so for those of you that have uh, 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 earphones here, you may want to, to get them ready. Um, as mayor of Lviv, uh, you founded uh, Samopovich and have been uh, leading the Self-Reliance Party, which did surprisingly well in the elections, pushing uh, an agenda of reform. Um, so from your perspective, sitting in Lviv, how is Kyiv doing and moving forward on this agenda? Please. Uh, Oksana bardzo uh, dobre uh, opowiadała o tej sytuacji, która jest i o tym wsparciem, które uh, potrzebujemy ze świata. Ale ja bym chciał mówić o tym, co mamy zrobić jutro. Normalne państwo można zbudować, kiedy w państwie jest partia ideologiczna, który bierze odpowiedzialność na siebie. I u mnie jest ambicja, żeby taka partia powstała i my ciężko w tym kierunku pracujemy. Na dzisiaj w Ukrainie, nie wiem, 270 partii jest. To jest nonsens. Ja bym chciał, żeby były partie ideologiczne. Jeździmy po regionach, pracujemy z ludźmi, szukamy ludzi. To jest praca na 5, na 10, nie wiem, na 20 lat. Druga rzecz to jest samorząd. Na jesień u nas wybory samorządowe i to jest bardzo ważne, bo tak, prezydent, premier, Warchowna Rada, ok, ale kto w miastach rządzi na dzisiaj, większa ilość to jest te ludzi, które były pod partią regionów. Trzeba, żeby te wybory były i trzeba, żeby była nowa ustawa przygłosowana w Warchownej Radzie, żeby te wybory były otwarte po partyjnych listach, żeby była szansa dla adekwatnych ludzi przyjść do Lady, żeby robić te zmiany, żeby była decentralizacja, bo niestety system się opiera, system się boje decentralizacji, bo u nas dużo o tym się zawsze mówiło 25 lat, ale tylko ostatnim czasem jest krok za krokiem, ale trzeba szybciej to wszystko robić.
To jest wielkie domaśnie zadanie, które musimy zrobić, żeby pokazać dla Europy, pokazać dla świata, że my jestem w synergii, bo my chcemy budować normalne państwo, żeby był sukces. Jestem przekonany, że wspólna pozycja świata, o czym mówiła Oksana, postawi Rosję na miejsce, ale my potrzebujemy doświadczenia, jak dobre budować państwo, jak dobre budować partii. My nie mamy tego doświadczenia. U nas była partia komunistyczna i 25 lat zawsze oligarchi proponowali koszty, i bardzo ważne, żeby była też ustawa w Ukrainie, żeby państwo wspierało finansowo partię, żeby była niezależność. Jestem przekonany, że to wszystko będzie przegłosowane, bo jest taka wola ukraińskiego narodu. Jestem wielkim optymistą. Ja wierzę w Ukrainę, wierzę, że będzie wszystko ok, ale ciężka praca, na co dzień ciężka praca, wtedy będzie rezultat. Dzięki. Mayor, let me just ask one follow-up question to that, because you've put an emphasis on local elections, on uh, decentralization. How do you relate that to Minsk and the issue of uh, how you handle elections in Donetsk or Lugansk uh, and what you're aware of as a, a real uh, vocal Russian call for mm -hmm. uh, federalization of Ukraine? To jest ciężkie pytanie. Ja nie pamiętam w historii za ostatnich 100 lat, żeby gdzieś w świecie były wybory na tych terytoriach, które jest okupowane. Jeżeli tam jest rosyjskie wojsko, jeżeli tam jest rosyjskie zbroje, jak tam można robić wybory? Ja sobie to nie przedstawię. To jest, nie, to jest no, można o tym myśleć, można o tym rozmawiać, ale jak to finalnie zrobić? Kiedy Rosja zabierze, nie wiem, 10 tam ile tysięcy swoich wojskowych stąd, technika wyjedzie, tam za tydzień czasu może być porządek. Po innemu to jest niemożliwe. Na dzisiaj mamy okupację i to jest fakt, który moim zdaniem wszystkie w tym, w tej sali rozumieją. Thank you, thank you very much. I want to pick up, um, continue the conversation uh, with the Minister of Economy uh, next to me. Uh, Minister Abramovich, um, you've got a pretty tough job here. And what we just heard in the conversation between Steve Hadley and Senator Shaheen on the stage was that perhaps the, Mr. Putin is going to be satisfied to sit back and just watch Ukraine's economy implode and fail, knowing that the West is going to be ambivalent in trying to assist. Uh, so it may not be further pressure militarily from the East. Uh, you're, you have in your portfolio uh, one of the front lines of the battle that's taking place. How do you see the task uh, ahead of you, and how are you credibly trying to address uh, Ukraine's uh, battle on this front? Oh, thank you very much. Um, I believe that if the uh, military situation does not escalate uh, in the East, then uh, the worst of the macroeconomic uh, um, indicators are already behind us. I look at them as a, sort of a rear view mirror. First quarter was uh, horribly bad, which is a result of uh, 25 years of uh, complete drought of uh, reforms in our country, 36 consecutive months of industrial output decline, 60% inflation. But the last reading already on the inflationary front uh, already makes us uh, believe uh, that the worst is behind us, three months of stabilization as a result of additional financial assistance from abroad and extraordinary measures that uh, Central Bank has taken. I think what is being done by the government and the part and the parliament is highly underappreciated both at home and abroad. There is a, a number of reforms that have already been passed that is simply poorly communicated out to the general public. And here we can highlight some of the main uh, uh, achievements on the energy sector reform. A new laws on uh, law on the gas market has been uh, passed, which uh, creates level playing field opportunities for everyone and market uh, pricing uh, uh, for this uh, commodity. We raised gas tariffs uh, by over 400%, which is completely unprecedented for any country at any given time uh, in history. Yet we created a completely indiscriminate and very transparent system of subsidies for the poor. So let the rich pay and we will compensate the poor half. 
some 12 million Ukrainians will receive subsidies when the heating uh, season uh, starts. And therefore, we will decrease, you know, the endless bit of corruption which Naftogaz has been over the years and the Klondike for enrichment for the blessed uh, few. Uh, and uh, basically, we'll um, make sure that this company raises corporate governance standards to a new level. Here, we also talk about uh, uh, sort of a, uh, reforms on the deregulation front. Uh, country with uh, weak institutions in early stage of development and with pretty high level of tolerance towards corruption cannot be an efficient regulator, cannot be an efficient uh, owner of a state asset. So it is important to continue to decrease the role of state here. You know, Ronald Reagan once said the nine most terrifying words in English, I am from the government and I'm here to help. So certainly Ukrainian business does not want government to help. So we'll need to make sure that the interaction between the private business and the government officials decreases to the minimum. We continue with the moratorium on the inspections by the fire department, by the tax police and by the others and let the business breathe uh, a little bit. And macroeconomic stabilization that we created, which was the key sort of a priority in the first six months, was very important for the stability of the banking sector. Remember, 49 banks went under in the last uh, 18 months out of 180, and the cleanup of the banking system by the central bank was much delayed, but very much needed. And we also passed the law on the responsibility of the bank owners, which brings more accountability to the sector, which will bring eventually a long-term uh, sort of a stability and uh, uh, predictability. So here a number of reforms just poorly communicated. We are beefing up communication departments in every ministry and also in the National Reform Council because we are losing communications war, especially to the populace at the local uh, elections uh, approach. And here it is also important to see the dynamics in president administration, in the government, in individual ministries. It is important to bring new people out of the private sector and into the public administration. This is a unique opportunity for everyone to contribute in Ukraine. And here, for example, we try to lead, uh, you know, by example, with, in our ministry, out of 1,200 people in six months, we laid off 400 and we hired 85 new, all with Western education, with Western experience working in, uh, in, in, in the companies. We want to show that laying off people and rehiring new unspoiled people is possible in a very short uh, period of time. But it is important here that this is followed by some major reform when it comes to public administration, that we need to show that when you cut numbers of public servants, the rest, the, the ones that stay as efficient managers, receive substantially higher pay. There's a record of reform and part of the challenge is communication, but clearly uh, everyone knows how much the Ukrainian economy has been dominated by key economic actors, oligarchs, if you will, um, that control capital, that control big business interests. How are you dealing with this, the reality of the Ukrainian economy when so many jobs are dependent on a structure of oligarchization? Well, the future of Ukraine, of course, is small and medium-sized enterprises. I mean, this is the part of also population that is active, independent mind thinking and so on. I mean, in Russia, we have a huge part uh, that is middle class, but they all work for state-owned enterprises, far from being the democratic part of the society. So we need to really make sure you know, to create level playing fields that small and medium sized enterprises uh, develop. When it comes to uh, uh, business tycoons, we have a serious uh, upcoming fight uh, with them uh, through demonopolization. Uh, and here we have a commitment written by the Ministry of Economic Development in the IMF memorandum that we are committed in the first half to change the whole composition of the anti monopoly committee and in the second half to. Uh, uh, implement the new legislation, which is already written by some of uh, uh, colleagues in the coalition agreement. We just need a copy-paste and so on. Uh, I personally also have picked up some of those fights. When I uh, became a minister, I immediately uh, decided to be chairman of the commission that sells Ukrnafta's oil. And uh, for years, uh, there was a 15% discount for selling that oil to mainly only one buyer. We immediately removed with a government decree this 15% discount, two months of blockage of uh, these oil auctions, but eventually the buyer, which was a famous business tycoon, had to accept the new rules uh, of play. Uh, this normally ended up with being $200 million benefit straight into his pocket. 
So let me, let me bring in Pablo Sharmetta on this conversation because as a former Minister of Economy, you've spent part of your career trying to build an entrepreneurial class in Ukraine as, as founder of Kiev Mihailova Business School as well as president of the School of Economics. Um, what's it going to take to actually uh, see a transition in an economy where small and medium enterprises are driving rather than tycoons? Uh, what's the progress uh, to date, Pablo? Thank you. Well, Ukraine was able to win the hearts and minds in the democratic world because of Maidan, because of the fight for freedom. Uh, but this freedom is incomplete yet. Uh, surprisingly, and even I would say embarrassingly, uh, being one of the probably most, uh, the, the freest politically uh, country in the Eastern Europe, uh, Ukraine remains the least free in economy. It's the least free country in terms of economics. It's less free than Belarus. It's less free than Russia. That's why basically Maidan has not finished yet. It's not over yet. Of course, it will be in a different form. It should be in a different form. But this fight is not over yet. Um, uh, how do we proceed? Uh, yesterday, I, I was so happy to learn from uh, uh, Marshal Sikorsky this uh, phrase that we were, there was a national obsession in Poland about joining EU and NATO, and he said we would eat grass for it, you know. And I'm thinking, where is our Ukrainian obsession? And actually, it's, it's an honor to be at this panel because uh, I'm quite sure that Oksana is, uh, is obsessed with, uh, in a good sense of the word, of course, with harmonizing Ukrainian legislation with, with European. Uh, the mayor Sadovy is obsessed with catching up, again, in a good sense of the word, with catching up with Wroclaw and Krakow and Prague and, and, and more. Um, uh, Minister Abramovich uh, is unlucky in the way because he has to eat uh, grass twice, first in Lithuania <laughs> to join the UN NATO and now, and now in Ukraine. Uh, now, but how does, how does that go down into the society? Because it has to be a two-way street, by the way, I, I agree in a way that um, uh, the communication should be positioned in a way it's not only the government, it's not only the president, it's not only the prime minister, it's not only the Rada, it's not only the mayor, it's not only the minister of economy who ensures the prosperity. It's the businesses, it's the managers, it's the owners, it's the two-way street. So uh, the government has to be obsessed with uh, uh, getting rid of, rid of corruption. Many things are done. Uh, with the fiscal stability and balanced budget, uh, very good things are done uh, during the last couple of months uh, with uh, uh, ensuring the equal access to opportunities, more things to be done, and simplifying business. Uh, we started that work how, a year ago with Easy Business in Ukraine. I'm so happy that the minister continues that work and actually and the Rada uh, adopted the law on deregulation. Uh, but there is a work in the society you know, to, uh, to have a better education, uh, to work more, to work more productively, to save more uh, in order to catch up uh, with, with the West. Uh, and uh, again, this cannot be done without the, the, the national obsession with, uh, with uh, 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 catching up with, uh, with uh, Western Europe. Because basically, uh, we have to understand that, and I, I will finish with this, uh, there are negative scenarios are looming, and it's something that we are thinking about at SIPA and some other, other institutions, I'm quite sure, both positive and negative, but negatives are basically the Greek scenario. Uh, I would call it austerity without growth. Austerity, we, we do have austerity. The new uh, drastically higher utility bills will come soon. Uh, the population will feel it. You know, where is the growth? And then uh, having the local uh, elections uh, in the fall, uh, you know, Syriza type of, uh, of uh, arrangement. In Ukraine, it will be most probably the opposition bloc, uh, winning in one third of the regions. That would be a reality most probably in the next six months. You know, how do we deal with that reality? Uh, again, in order for Ukraine to achieve the tipping point in reforms, more needs to be done, we all know this from the government, but may, much more needs to be done also from the society. And I also would like to appeal to the, to the, uh, to the world uh, to support these efforts uh, more as well, to achieve the tipping point in Ukrainian transformation. So just a quick follow up on this, because the, for the world to help in this sense is basically often translates into foreign direct investment as a key recipe for growth. And yet there is a war taking place uh, in Ukraine 
Um, it is, we have Prime Minister Yatsenu coming to the United States for uh, an investment conference, yet when you talk to a lot of foreign investors, it's pretty difficult to see them putting a lot of capital at risk in Ukraine today. How do you get that piece of the equation right, given the, the, the reality on the ground? This piece of equation has two variables. Variable number one is Ukrainian investment. There will be no foreign investment if Ukrainian investors do not recommend foreign investors to invest into Ukraine. And at the moment, they do not. And the war is only, only a piece of that. Another piece of that is the state at large, and that's a post-Soviet legacy, still has a predatory, you know, extortionist uh, attitude, you know, to business, as if the business is the enemy. You know, it has to change, and it's changing slowly, but it, the change is there. Uh, into developmental mode uh, towards business. But it has to go through the whole hierarchy. At the moment, we have the best government we ever had. They appointed good deputies. You know, some of the department chairs are here as well. You know. But you know, further on, you know, going into the regions uh, as, as well. Uh, that's the equation number one, having a developmental attitude towards business. Uh, uh, local investors, first of all. The second uh, piece of equation is, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, public insurance, uh, the government, uh, governmental insurance for private investments, something that George Soros, for example, uh, recommended in his article in, in, in January. But ultimately, of course, yes, we do need investment, both local and foreign, into Ukraine. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, you know, I mean, again, I mean, let's, let's think about the numbers. Last year we had minus 7%, this year we'll have probably minus 9%. If we do not change savings and investment in, into the country, uh, the, the projected growth is 2 to 3%. It will take another generation to, to come out just from this dip, you know. I'm not even talking about, you know, catching up with, uh, with Poland or, or, or Western Europe. So we need a dramatically different paradigm of uh, thinking. And, and, and part of the thinking is actually, again, being obsessed with creating the most free, the, the simplest conditions for business in the country. Thank you very much, Pavel. Let me turn to your, uh, next to you to, to Eugene, Eugene Choi, who represents uh, the 25 million, uh, uh, 25 million individuals that uh, trace their heritage to Ukraine as part of the diaspora. Um, it's a diaspora that stood by Ukraine through good times and bad. But what is your community's assessment of how Ukraine is doing today? And what's your assessment of how the, the countries that they live in are doing in supporting Ukraine? Uh, thank you uh, for the question, Damon. Let me start first, since you mentioned at the outset that we are a partner, I'm, I should add a proud partner of the Atlantic Council for a superbly well-organized forum. Uh, in answering your question, I just came back uh, uh, this week prior to uh, coming to Wroclaw. Uh, I was in Kyiv, and I'm still amazed every time when I come uh, to see that Ukraine, after having gone through a tremendously difficult and challenging Euromaidan that included uh, the shooting with, by snipers of the Heavenly Hundred, not yet having buried those that were shot, saw Ukraine being the object of Russian aggression and the illegal occupation of Crimea, and thereafter with the aggression in eastern Ukraine. In addition to the psychological pressure, with statements like by President Putin to President, at the time, Barroso, that I can be in Kyiv within two weeks. Two days. That not, no, two days. no, two weeks. Uh, that notwithstanding all of that, that Ukraine, when you come to Ukraine, it looks like a country that is still acting as a normal country. A country that was able, notwithstanding all of these challenges, to go through a democratic presidential election then through a democratic parliamentary election and to adopt legislation and various measures in order to implement the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. So clearly a country that, notwithstanding the tremendous challenges, is moving forward. That being said, we shouldn't be fooled by that. And we, as the 
when I say we, I mean the international community, the United States, Europe, should not treat Ukraine as though it was business as usual. Ukraine is dealing in an extremely challenging time. And the international community should not only give loans to Ukraine, but financial assistance to enable Ukraine to, to overcome the consequences of Russian aggression. And I'm thinking of economic assistance akin to the Marshall Plan. I'm also looking at a visa-free regime that would definitely make the choice made by Ukrainians to go towards Europe irreversible. That is the best way to ensure that we have a stable and secure Europe. Ukraine is not only fighting and in the East and working in very challenging times, but it's also fighting a force, a tremendous, a very powerful force that is doing everything possible, militarily and with Russian disinformation to convince the international community and to convince Ukrainians in Ukraine that Ukraine is either now a failed state or will become shortly uh, thereafter. And I think that if one looks, President Putin very conservatively said that he will be investing this year about 643 million euros to assist Russian media in portraying the vision according to President Putin. And we call things by their names. That is clearly to disinform the international community. And in order to address these issues and to help Ukraine become what it can be, a potentially superb partner both of the United States and of all of the member states of the EU, we need to deal with Ukraine not in the traditional way as though business was as usual, but to deal with Ukraine in very extreme uh, conditions. Terrific. Thank you very much, Eugene, and thank you for UWC's partnership in this effort. I want to come back to a point that Eugene raised for all the panel about extraordinary steps, but let me first bring in Ambassador Jeff Pyatt. Uh, Ambassador, your job is both to push the Ukrainians to continue to do, uh, to do some of the right things, but also to push Washington to do. So let me ask the same question I asked Eugene. From your perspective, what's your assessment of how uh, Ukraine is doing and how are we doing in supporting Ukraine? Yeah, thanks, Damon. And I think the best answer to the question of can Ukraine prevail is right here on this stage today. And I think you heard from all of the Ukrainian participants a very strong commitment to driving ahead with the process of mil building a modern democratic European state. Like the Maidan itself, this does not come from Brussels or from Washington or Berlin. It comes from the grassroots. And certainly when I look at the past 16 months of Russian aggression against Ukraine, the most striking phenomenon is exactly that resilience, that determination of Ukrainian society to continue to move forward, to continue to tackle these issues. Uh, you know, the, the word that I think of most often when I look back on this is hedonist, dignity, the demand of the Ukrainians to choose their own future. Um, it's important to remember, to answer the earlier question, the territory controlled by Russian and separatist forces in eastern Ukraine amounts to 3% of the country. By no means should that 3% of Ukrainian territory hold hostage the rest of Ukraine as it moves towards a European future. There's important progress that's been achieved, more that remains to be done. I'll tick off a couple of critical ones for you. Um, one has been alluded to by Mayor Salabi. It's the question of decentralization and constitutional reform. There is a meaningful and far-reaching debate that's going, going forward. And what's most striking to me there is whether it's with the mayor in Lviv or in Kharkiv or in Odessa, across Ukraine, you see a readiness to move towards greater local authority, decentralization, deepening of democracy, getting away from this power vertical which reached its culmination under Yanukovych's centralization of both power and corruption, and to build something that looks more like European standards of democracy, 
uh, the, the phrase of subsidiarity has become part of the conversation, and we are keenly interested in the success of this, of this debate over constitutional reform, and it, it brings real decentralization. Another, of course, is energy reform, an area that has been a black hole of corruption for the Ukrainian economy, but has also been the lever that Russia has used to deny Ukraine's strategic choice. The government has made dramatic progress in diversifying its energy sources, not just on gas, but also on nuclear, on coal. The United States has been a good partner there. There's more to be done. I would also really praise what the RADA has done in terms of revisions to, to energy pricing, moving towards full cost recovery for, um, uh, for the gas sector, getting away from the distorting subsidies that have dragged down the economy and dragged down NAFTA gas. Another area that we need to recognize, what the RADA and the government have accomplished with a genuinely courageous IMF program, implementing dramatic changes on fiscal policy, on pension policy, sticking to that tough road in the assurance that, that the United States, Europe, the IMF, the international community will do our part to help make this the foundation for growth. Um, finally, security sector reform. Uh, it's critically important to reinforce Ukraine's capacity to defend its own sovereign territory. I'm enormously proud of what the 173rd Airborne has accomplished with our training program for the National Guard at Yavoriv, but that's just a start. I'm also extremely proud of what we're doing in the police sector with the Interior Ministry. Ukraine, Kyiv's new patrol police is a model for the whole country. I know from Mayor Salabi how eager they are to see the same come to, come, to, uh, come to Lviv, but we'll be doing the same in Odessa, in Kharkiv, across Ukraine. Last couple of quick points. I think for all of us in the international community, as Steve Hadley said, we cannot afford to allow Ukraine to fail because this experiment in democratic revolution is not just about Ukraine and 46 million Ukrainians. It's about the whole Russian periphery. It's about the European model of democracy and governance and rule of law, and it's about our vision of a Europe whole and free and at peace. Remember, the Ukrainians are the first people in history to fight and, fight and die under the flag of the European Union. Think about that for a minute. So this is not about Ukraine. It's about all of us. It's about our transatlantic community. It's about a vision of regional security. And we need to, as Damon said, both work hard to hold the Ukrainians to the high standards that the Ukrainian people have set for themselves, and we will be relentless in that cause, but also work jointly, the United States with our G7 and European partners, to give the Ukrainians the, the support that they need in order to succeed. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, that's a pretty powerful image of Ukrainians fighting and dying for, first to fight and die for the European Union, in fact. Um, but what we see unfolding right now is the challenge of a failure, if you will, of European diplomacy and transatlantic diplomacy over uh, with Ukraine, with what's happening in, with Minsk and Minsk II. So just help us imagine what, what's coming next. Uh, where do we go next as Minsk II seems to be crumbling uh, before us, or is there a prospect that this will hold? Well, I, I'll say two quick things and then turn to my Euro Ukrainian colleagues. Um, First, it's way too early to declare the failure of Minsk. Um, we need to hold Russia to what it signed on to in Minsk I and then again in Minsk II. Um, it's very important, as we have done so far, to continue to impose a price on Russia for its continued aggression. Important to recognize the multiple steps that Ukraine has taken to uphold its Minsk obligations and the utter failure of Russia to comply with it, what, what it should have done, to include the withdrawal of heavy weapons, the cessation of support to fighting. Um, you look at the situation today. Right now, today, you still have Russian forces, Russian equipment moving across the international border. You have two Russian Spetsnaz who were picked up in Shastia a few weeks ago. Um, Russia continues to defy the promises that it made to the international community at Minsk, and we need to bear that in mind, that there is a victim and an aggressor in this case. And then we need to continue to work towards the benchmarks that Minsk sets not only in terms of a ceasefire and the withdrawal of heavy weapons, but also in terms of the restoration of Ukrainian control over the international border by the end of 2015. That, for me, is the litmus test of Russian seriousness. The moment that the OSCE is able to control that international border, Ukraine is able to retain or re regain control over its sovereign territory, I know that diplomacy will be moving forward. I want to bring in the audience into the conversation, so catch my eye. I'm going to put one question on the table and then call on a couple 
to for our Ukrainian colleagues, um, back to Eugene's point that we shouldn't be seeing this as business as usual. And uh, we heard uh, Mr. Hadley earlier call for uh, thinking of a new strategic framework for how our response should be commensurate with the challenge rather than being stuck by our own bureaucratic limitations that, for example, prevent some of our export agencies for backing capital in Ukraine because of the political risk. If our Ukrainians could name one thing, uh, one dramatic move that's not on the table right now, but if we were thinking differently about what was possible from the international community's support for Ukraine, what would you like to see? What could be a significant game changer in your support from the international community? Just very quickly, maybe Oksana, Andre, come back down the line with our Ukrainians, and then I want to pull in a couple of folks from the audience as well. So I'm happy. Great. I think that probably the most crucial support would not be it would now uh, be needed for the um, development of state institutions. We are actually. This, uh, we face this where we got to power, and the minister can confirm this, we face a system that is not operational at all. It was ruined, it was ruined by the by lack of wisdom, it was ruined uh, to the big extent by Russians who have been uh, actually in power in Ukraine for many years through their agents. And uh, in a lot of senses, we don't have the proper bureaucracy, proper judiciary and so on, so we need to, so, to develop new institutions. Actually, uh, the proof that we are in a good uh, uh, track, in a right track, is the resistance of this old system that we face and we experience every single day. So assistance with transforming state institutions. Mr. Mayor, can you add uh, one thing that you'd like to see from the international community that's not on the table right now? W moim zdaniu bardzo ważne na dzisiaj nie tylko pracować z rządem, z administracją prezydenta, ale pracować i wspierać samorządy, bo tam jest realna praca, realna polityka. Można zamknąć na jakiś czas w obłościach administracji, czy może ministerstwo jakieś nie pracować, nie wiem, tam tydzień, miesiąc. Ale kiedy na przykład jakiś samorząd nie będzie pracować dzień, to będzie katastrofa. I e, trzeba uczyć ludzi, trzeba dawać nowe doświadczenie, trzeba e, dawać e, nową dynamikę dla partnerstwa między miastami, bo każde ukraińskie miasto ma swoich partnerów w Unii, kto w Polsce, kto w Niemczech, kto w Francji, w Italii. I to potrzebna nowa dynamika i to potrzebna dynamika od wszystkich państw Unii, od Stanów, żeby te reformy, te zmiany, to nie były tylko zmiany z góry, ale z wszystkich części naszego państwa. Trzeba uczyć ludzi. I w to w moim zdaniu to jest ta sprawa, która bardzo ważna na dzisiaj. Thank you very much. Let me turn to uh, Minister Sikorski, Marshal Sikorski, uh, and then I'll come over here. Yes, second, please. I have one suggestion. And I spoke to uh, one of the mayors, uh, and we discussed um, how the uh, tax system works for municipalities. And he told me, uh, may you can confirm it or, um, or not, that municipalities receive a portion of the excise duty, uh, tax on um, tobacco and alcohol, but no portion of the corporation tax. In other words, it is in your interest for your citizens to drink and smoke more, but not necessarily to set up businesses. I would um, suggest that maybe um, uh, in Poland it's the other way around. And my question is the following. Ukraine was absolutely in its right, but if I may say so, it's a courageous move to have um, abrogated that agreement with the Russians on the uh, transit to uh, Transistria. Mm -hmm. I don't know who can answer this, but how do you expect it to play out? Will they just take away their so-called peacekeepers? Or will they maintain a la a, an air bridge and thereby Putin's costs of maintaining that particular frozen conflict um, are raised? Or will it be used as a negotiating chip in some other negotiation? Excellent question. Um, let me pick up, uh, please, yes. 
Let's see. Yes, there it goes. Uh, Dr. Katarzyna Pisarska, I'm the director of the European Academy of Diplomacy in Warsaw. Uh, I fully agree this is an exceptional moment and it can be a historical moment for Ukraine uh, to, to change to in 20 years be uh, just where Poland is today. But the question that has not been answered in the panel is how is Ukraine dealing with the information warfare? Because the information warfare uh, that is waged against Ukraine, but also the West, influences the amount of investments that comes uh, to Ukraine. The way that the Ukrainian government is perceived, what is being done, what is not being done. It's, it's, it's enough to really spread the world that, the, that it is a Ukrainian conflict or it's a Ukrainian crisis and not uh, a war, uh, that uh, the economy is doing very bad and that changes the whole game. So, of course, you cannot deal alone with it. Your role as, as the Ukrainian government, as Ukrainians, is surely to make sure that the propaganda does not reach and influence your own society. But what can we do together in order to counter this uh, information warfare, which, again, is not only against you, it's actually more against us, the West, uh, and this community uh, of democracy. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let me pick up the third question, I think was right here with the, uh, yes, you, sir. Yes, yes, you. No, you, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Tom Firestone from the law firm Baker & McKenzie. One of the biggest issues for foreign investment into Ukraine is corruption. And you hadn't really discussed this, and I know that the government has done a lot in this regard, setting up a National Anti-Corruption Bureau, passing other serious legislation. And I'm wondering if any of the members of the panel could comment on the recent removal of General Prosecutor Shokin and whether or not you see this as a step forward in um, combating corruption and perhaps uh, reorchestrating law enforcement yes, efforts in this regard. Sure. Thank you. I'm going to come back to the panel. I don't want each of you to answer all the questions, but I, I do want somebody to pick up the alignment of tax incentives that uh, Marshal Sikorsky asked about, uh, the Transnistria abrogation of the agreement, uh, information warfare, and the Prosecutor General's corruption. Um, who wants to start with one of those elements? Maybe can I work from you, Pavlo, back down? Is there one you pick up? Um, was was general prosecutor removed? I mean, that's, the, that's in I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, either no. the alignment of taxes for incentives no. for local authorities or the prosecutor general dismissal. It, and, uh, I leave it to the mayor. I just wanted yes. to answer the, the the corruption and uh, and foreign investment. Um, uh, that is one of the major concerns, obviously, uh, for foreign uh, investors. Uh, it's not only uh, the work of the uh, um, uh, General Prosecutor Office, uh, it's the whole judicial system. Uh, I hope, uh, as we all hope, that this bureau will help in this. Uh, but uh, the principle that should be upheld here is this zero tolerance to corruption. Uh, I, I know it may sound naive, but I just don't see another way to tackle that. And by the way, when I, see, when I say zero uh, tolerance to, corrupt, to corruption, I don't mean only the Ukrainian authorities. I also mean, for example, the esteemed and revered U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you know, there, are, there is always uh, issues, uh, there are always uh, um, options, and uh, you know, we all have to take the options, but we have to take the right options. Uh, and when we have this, uh, this zero tolerance to corruption attitude, uh, as, uh, as uh, demonstrated in, uh, in successful countries in this, uh, in this regard in the world, uh, it, you ultimately succeed. But, um, you know, if you have a, the cost of untouchables uh, in the country, because this is the, this is the sponsor of the party, uh, this is the godfather to, to your son or the daughter, well, let's pick up the person C, but the problem, if you, you know, if you start uh, prosecuting the person C, he knows about the person A and B, uh, and, and makes it public, you know, so you, can, you cannot touch person C. So, so that becomes uh, a mess, uh, which, which we have at the moment. Thank so you, zero Pablo. tolerance to corruption. And I'm going to ask, uh, uh, maybe Oksana, you can add on the Prosecutor General, I think uh, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Minister on the taxes issue, and then I'll bring Eugene on, on information, maybe Ambassador Pyatt on Transdistry as well. So Oksana, please, uh, just quick answers so we good, can bring in some more questions. Very good question, questions. because of course the uh, corruption is one of the biggest points, but the, the corruption is the, um, the, the matter of corruption, this is actually the matter of uh, one of the factors of the oligarchy economy. Because oligarchs, when they establish this kind of economy that we are still facing, 
uh, they uh, created the demand for the corruption because corrupted uh, judges, investigators, prosecutors, they were those who were supposed to protect the, uh, the money and the businesses of the oligarchs. So now tackling the uh, issue of bringing oligarchs to the normal um, legal environment of big businesses, we have at the same time uh, struggle for the, uh, against corruption in, um, in, the, uh, in all those areas, including prosecution. And prosecution, as I've been mentioning, the resistance, the prosecutorial system is one of those where the, this resistance is very much uh, felt. And uh, we are working to actually to uh, concur it every single day. In particular, there was a big fight on the legislation last year to adopt new law on the prosecution. This year, the prosecution made an attempt to actually come back to the Soviet-style uh, operation, and we didn't allow this. And we are doing this in all different manners, including civil society involvement, including communication to prosecutor general and to prosecutors. We are trying to convince them that there is no way for them to come back to the business as usual as it used to be years ago. And, so the prosecutor uh, the, general's dismissal was a step in that, in uh, that direction. Yeah, and the prosecution general, if he, uh, the, this is the issue of accountability, if he fails to, uh, to fulfill this, then he should be accountable for this. Mr. Minister, taxes, and maybe, Mayor, I'll bring you on, in on the taxes as well. Yeah, we had yesterday a meeting at the presidential administration with selected ministers, uh, all mayors of the city, of the larger cities and uh, regional governors, where we discussed decentralization. And on a number of occasions, President said, let's do the copycat of the Polish uh, decentralization. So uh, the tax reform, uh, which is not a real reform, but some changes uh, from 22 taxes to down to 11 in December, did not decrease the tax burden on business. But it actually uh, increased the amount of tax revenues for the regions. In the first uh, five months, 10 billion given or more than during the same period of year down from the center to the regional level. But uh, throughout the summer, we are debating um, tax reform. Uh, it is led the effort by the Minister of Finance. In October, we vote in uh, Verkhovna Rada, and from the 1st of January, we have a new tax system which would hopefully result in a decrease of the uh, shadow economy, increase uh, of uh, uh, investments and job creation and so on. So we will move quite likely, you know, closer to the Polish version of the tax reform and decentralization. And Andre, did you want to add a word to uh, the tax incentives for local no, authorities? A jeżeli e, sobie ujawić mapę na przykład Ukrainy, to e, gdzie jest większa e, demokratyzacja, demokracja? Tam, gdzie jest rozwój małego i średniego biznesu. Tam, gdzie biznes wielki, gdzie jest właścicieli oligarchii, no, demokratyzacja idzie w dół. Dlatego bardzo ważne, żeby samorząd e, miał w część od podatku na dochody, żeby nie, nie państwo miało 100%, a żeby samorząd miał 10-20%. Wtedy będzie większy rozwój. Na przykład e, parę dni temu e, u nas był wielki konkurs e, na e, park industrialny i potężna e, holenderska e, firma CTP wygrała prawo zbudować park industrialny. I ja wierzę, że to będzie dobry przykład dla e, innych miast. Jeżeli mówić o media, e, nie wiem czy znacie, ale budżet Russia Today parę razy więcej, czym budżet e, wszystkich media ukraińskich. To jest fantastyczne koszty i nam będzie e, ciężko e, samym walczyć. Tu musi być wsparcie i, i Stanów, i Europy i trzeba pracować, żeby Ukraina coraz mała mniej E, niezależnych media, bo na dzisiaj wszystkie główne kanale telewizyjne to jest własność oligarchów. I jeżeli nie będzie ustawy o e, wsparcia e, partii finansowego, no to wybory ciężko zrobić, żeby one były demokratyczne i demokracja e, brała e, górę. To wszystko jest związane, ale co jest główna rzecz, że my to rozumiemy, my znamy co robić i my to robimy. Jest ciężko, jest e, ciężka wojna, ale to, co Oksana robi, to, co frakcja partii Samopomoc robi w parlamencie, jeszcze raz mówię, jestem optymistą.
na dzisiaj wasze wsparcie i myśleć, co musi być jutro. Uczyć ludzi. Uczyć tych, kto będzie pracować za rok, za pięć ministrami, burgomistrami i tak dalej. I e, wszystko będzie ok. Dzięki. Jeff, uh, Transnistria, can you shed some light on this uh, dynamic with the uh, Ukrainian abrogation of the agreement for Russian troop movements? Sure, just gladly, Damon. Let me start very quickly with Tom's question about corruption, though, just to make the point that there is no issue that is a greater threat to Ukraine's long-term success today than institutionalized corruption. I've said in the past it's a bigger threat than Russian tanks. Um, and the demand for change comes from the grassroots. The Ukrainian people themselves are looking for systemic change. We are prepared to help through our Department of Justice, through our FBI, through our technical assistance programs. The Europeans are as well. Uh, but ultimately, the problem has to be owned by Ukrainian institutions, Ukrainian political leaders, and frankly, Ukrainian business groups that just have to say no. And they, they need to change expectations and change behaviors. The Transnistria issue is nested into, into this because, to just look at the map for a minute, if you want to find the Bermuda Triangle of corruption in Ukraine, it's probably Odessa, um, nested between <laughs> Crimea and all of the historic corruption that took place there, the port in Odessa, and Transnistria. Rampant smuggling, rampant corruption. Um, Governor Shashkavili has an opportunity to answer a question I have posed publicly in the past, which is, what will be Ukraine's capital of anti-corruption? What will be the region which will make itself known for clean governance and a zero-tolerance attitude towards corruption? I've had this conversation with Mayor Salabi as well, and maybe Lviv will win. But I think there's a marvelous opportunity with a new management in Odessa to dramatically break with the past. And I think Transnistria is very much part of that. How do you get a handle on all of the all of the bad things that have moved across the Transnistrian frontier and all of the bad influences that have taken hold in Odessa over many, many years, uh, which the new Oblast leadership has an opportunity to change. Thank you, Jeff. And did you want to add a word, Eugene, on the info? I wanted to add a word on uh, Russian disinformation. I think that clearly it's one of the biggest challenges for Ukraine today, not only for Ukraine in Ukraine, but also for the Ukrainian diaspora. Uh, I've already mentioned that uh, the Russian president said to one of the think tanks this year, and that's probably a, a very conservative number, that 643 million euros are, are going to be invested to support media. Uh, I think that the problem that Ukraine faces is that type of budget, and also to a certain degree that we live in a strange world. Uh, by that I mean that the Russian president is trying to fool the international community that he's not invading Ukraine. And the international community, even worse, is fooling itself that it's addressing the issue effectively. On the issue of lethal weapons, everybody knows, all the decision makers know very well who is in Ukraine, what is deployed in Ukraine, that the Russian army is clearly in Ukraine, it was since August of last year. And instead of addressing the issue, or at least being quiet on the issue of lethal, weapon, lethal defensive weapons, Western leaders immediately stated that they will not be sending boots on the ground and there will be no lethal defensive weapons in support of Ukraine. And surprisingly, during the same time, there was a debate whether to send the mistrals to the aggressor while not doing anything with the victim of the aggression. The second issue is we talk about a big game about sanctions. And people say, well, it, it, it's going to take a bit more time. It's going to do this. It already has done something else. At the end of the day, you evaluate sanctions on the basis of whether that has changed the conduct of the aggressor. Clearly, so far, the Russian president is still on a daily basis violating the UN Charter, the Budapest Agreement, Minsk I, Minsk II, and a whole slew of other agreements. Instead of addressing that issue, the international community keeps repeating in all of its statements, including the most recent ones, that if 
the Russian president changes his ways, that the sanctions will be lowered, as opposed to saying that if he continues with what he has been doing and is doing on a daily basis, that the sanctions will be harsher. So yes, there is a big disinformation war to be addressed. But there's also a need for the international leaders that are well informed of what is happening in Ukraine to understand that if they do not see the urgency of the situation in Ukraine, that if they do not see that this is not a Ukrainian crisis but an international crisis, that what has been mentioned a few times during the, the other panels, that the Russian president, who has clearly tested the international community since nine, the, the early 90s, when he started to destabilize the neighboring countries, the international community turned a blind eye and continued with Russia business as usual. That emboldened the Russian president to continue into Crimea. The international community did what it does best, one resolution after another condemning the, the, the aggression in Crimea. But then to a certain degree, it accepted that as a fait accompli. That emboldened Russian president to go into Crimea the reaction was weak, and as any dictator with imperialist ambitions will do, he went further. He's testing the international community with eastern Ukraine. He is now saying that he will need to join the two areas. He has already said that Kazakhstan was never a country. So clearly, the Russian president is challenging the international community, and if the international community does not react in a decisive, clear manner today, then Section 5, the famous Section 5 of the NATO agreement, will be tested by President Putin, and NATO will then have to decide whether to sacrifice another country or whether to engage into the Third World War. Thank you very much for those sober words, Eugene. We're about to hit the witching hour. I want to close out with the last two questions, if I might, over here. And uh, I'll do real quick here, here, and here, please. Alan Roddy, City University. I just want to pick up on the point about the and media. Quick, quick questions for each of you. Yeah, yeah okay, my, my simple question is this is that there's all the issue of the, the problem of access to the media for the government because of the, olig the oligarchs controlling the media. Um, there's the Russian disinformation as well and the Russian, additional Russian media. Would one of the helps for the Ukrainian government would be for a much stronger presence of Western broadcasts in Ukraine, in Ukrainian and Russian from the BBC, Voice of America, CBC and so on? That's my question. All right, thank you. And, and please direct your question to one of the panelists if it's... Well, I think after the uh, previous intervention, it's almost a pity to end on any other note, except the one that, that was so eloquently here, here. put forward. Uh, I'll just simply add my voice to, 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 the, to the speakers by saying it really is time that we stop talking about a Ukrainian crisis. We have a Russian crisis. And uh, in terms of... Um, um, the previous point about making English language media available to, um, uh, to people in Eastern Ukraine, it seems rather fanciful. I suggest we think of the next stage of sanctions, if there need to be some, uh, as involving one very simple move, and that is banning Russia today throughout the whole of the West. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, please, uh, we'll take the last comment question right here in the front row. So, Rosa, it's, uh, thank you. Uh, um, Andrei Dushet, Ambassador of Ukraine to Poland. And it's a rather um, comment, uh, not a question, to uh, defend or maybe to strengthen those messages that were given by my colleagues during the panel uh, discussion. Um, we often compare the uh, reforms in Ukraine and Poland, and uh, we are criticized that the pace of reform is too slow. But please do remember that 
fundamental two differences that we have uh, in Ukraine and in Poland of uh, 1990s. At uh, the time of 1990s, Russian troops were going out of Poland and not going into Ukraine, uh, not going into Poland, what we have now in Ukraine. And in 1990s, Poland did have the clear signal of uh, EU and NATO membership. We do not have such a clear signal. We do need such a signal to mobilize society, to mobilize uh, uh, reforms, to mobilize uh, France to implement these reforms. And if we will get it, it I, I believe that it will be much, much easier to perform what, what was said by my colleagues. Thank you, Ambassador. If you have a brief comment, just catch my eye, Oksana, please. Thank you very much. The question about the media was uh, fantastic. And, uh, you know, to the big extent, we are so vulnerable in the sense of delivering our information and uh, so-called uh, propaganda war, because until now, a lot of uh, the headquarters of major media are still located in Moscow for, this, for the whole region. And unfortunately, even this physical location of the uh, headquarters responsible for Ukraine, like BBC, CNN, uh, like uh, New York Times, uh, and other very prominent media. Unfortunately, this location, to, to the big extent, shift the angle of perception. If they would, if there, those headquarters would be moved to Warsaw, Berlin, I don't know, Vilnius, doesn't matter, but the angle of perception would be shifted, I can tell you, uh, Definitely, because uh, and if you would see even the, the, um, uh, the translation from Maidan, that was actually what struck me. The BBC and CNN translation from Maidan back in uh, 2013. The, uh, the, it was the night uh, stream and the journalist was staying on the barricade saying that from on this side, there is this is Ukrainian, pro-Ukrainian, pro-European pro, uh, supporters. But on the other side of the barricade, there are pro-Russian supporters. When at, at that he was speaking this at the time, but on the so other side of the barricade, there was nobody but military troops. This is the police troops. This is the fact. And I believe that if the journalist would be would come not from. Russia, not from Moscow headquarters, they would be able to cope with this angle. And Mr. Minister, you want a brief yeah, word? Journalism, unfortunately, often works in such a way that uh, negative things, scandalous uh, uh, things, uh, get more coverage than the positive ones. But I was in uh, Odessa last uh, Tuesday, where, uh, among other things, I met um, Governor Saakashvili, and he was sitting on the pavement uh, speaking to endless amount of uh, Western journalists. And he says, don't worry, Odessa will get uh, a lot of uh, coverage in the next two weeks because I will speak just about everyone. So some of us are better at marketing than, than others. And let's hope that, uh, you know, uh, when Sikashvili gets uh, some quick wins uh, to demonstrate uh, that journalists will come uh, in uh, bigger amounts uh, to cover all the other success stories that we will have in Ukraine. Terrific. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I do agree with the comment that uh, it was probably most appropriate to let Eugene Choley's uh, comments stand as a conclusion to this conversation. They were quite powerful, uh, important, and, and dramatic words. But I want to end our conversation with where Ambassador Pyatt kicked off, um, that part of the takeaway that we have is the promise and the hope for Ukraine is by the people that are sitting up here uh, on stage. Uh, not our Ukrainian friends, of course, but their friends. Um, this is a group of people that are fighting uh, every day for a European Ukraine and are doing the tough things to actually bring that to reality. Uh, so I want to first and foremost thank all of you, not just for spending, taking precious time to come and join us in Vaclav, uh, but what you'll be doing when you go back uh, to continue your work in, in, in this effort. And in that respect, I think it's uh, quite an appropriate note that we conclude the Vaclav Global Forum uh, with a conversation about Ukraine, uh, because it's going to fuel, I think, many of those uh, delegates, many of those that came and spent a few days with here in Vaclav, uh, that we're all here as part of a community that understands that we have a crisis on our hands and that we all have a role to play in responding to this, so that our response collectively as a community is commensurate with the challenge that we see.